Larry, believe it or not, North Carolina had a city that was being taken over by former slaves who mm -hmm. learned how to read, how to run government, and that was Wilmington, North Carolina. And in 1898, we had a massacre here too. And I have to keep playing these because some folks don't understand why black folks get mad when you see people caking up with folks like Trump who is trying to recreate race wars, division, and just act like everything that black people have been through is nothing. And he's saturating people's mind to the point where some folks is really believing this stuff. So yeah. this right here is going to give you guys a little bit of the history about black North Carolina, which was Wilmington, NC, and what happened with our race riot. During the last decade of the 19th century, African Americans were a vibrant part of Wilmington's culture. African Americans had established themselves not only as a vital part of economic life, but soon to be part of the political arena. The election of 1894 saw a well-established political campaign designed by populists and Republicans. Populist Marion Butler and Republican Daniel Russell created the Fusion Coalition, and by the 1894 election, Fusion candidates defeated Democrats statewide and gained control of the General Assembly. Local elections also saw Democrats defeated and replaced with Fusion candidates and even black community leaders. The mid 1890s political atmosphere began to change in North Carolina with the election of Governor Daniel Russell, the first Republican governor in North Carolina since Reconstruction. The state legislator of 1897 made large changes to Wilmington City Charter. Local white leaders were dissatisfied and angry with the changes. During this time, Wilmington's black businesses grew at a faster pace than any other North Carolina city. In 1897, over 1,000 African Americans owned some sort of property in Wilmington. The city's African-American population was enriched by schools, wealth, and inherited status. Months before the election of 1898, the city of Wilmington still had a black population that was a majority. Leading up to the election, the city was occupied by the Democratic Party's white supremacist movement. Democrats were certain that an intimidation campaign filled with white supremacist propaganda would tear apart the fragile connection between whites and blacks in the Fusion Coalition. The White Government League, led by Alfred Waddell, introduced a powerful line of intimidation to white Republicans and African Americans. The Red Shirt Brigade, established by Fernifold Simmons, had spread throughout eastern North Carolina and its strongest contingency was in New Hanover County. In the fall of 1898, the Red Shirts held racist rallies, disrupted African American church services, and walked the streets of Wilmington with weapons. Along with the White Government League, they distributed flyers and political cartoons depicting blacks as corrupt and detrimental to white society. Facing hatred and intimidation, African Americans still turned out in large numbers on Election Day. However, the extremely large volume of Democrats outnumbered the Republicans and populists. Although there were reports of ballot box stuffing by white supremacists, overall, Election Day was peaceful with little unrest. Motivated by their victory, on November 9th, 25 white men met at the courthouse. They listed their demands on the African American community and presented the white man's Declaration of Independence. They demanded the immediate removal of Alex Manley and his newspaper, The Daily Record, from the city. Additional resolutions called for the resignation of the mayor and the chief of police. On the evening of November 9th, the Committee of Colored Citizens was called to hear the demands of the white supremacist. In attendance was Alfred Waddell and his Committee of 25. The Committee of Colored Citizens drafted a humble response and attempted to separate the black community from Manley and his newspaper. Preceding the riot on November 10th, Alfred Waddell scheduled a meeting at the Light Infantry Armory to receive the response from the Committee of Colored Citizens. 500 additional white men were also present. The response never came, and Waddell used the fury of the crowd to his advantage. He led the angry mob to Manley's newspaper on 3rd Street. During the procession, the crowd grew to almost 2,000 people. Upon reaching the newspaper office, the crowd destroyed the printing press and burned the building. The violence spread throughout the city. 
African Americans gathered weapons to defend themselves as whites patrolled the streets searching for blacks to carry out Waddell's claim to choke the Cape Fear River with Negro carcasses. At around 11 a.m., near the intersection of 4th and Harnett Streets, in the mostly black community of Brooklyn, a gun battle broke out. When it was over, several African American men lay dead or wounded. This moving gun battle continued to Manhattan Park, a gathering place deep in the black community, where bullets destroyed the surrounding fence and damaged many homes and buildings. During the violence and gunfire, Waddell and other white leaders demanded the resignations of the mayor and board of aldermen. Waddell was elected mayor by a new board of aldermen who had been appointed by a small group of Democratic leaders that afternoon. Within hours of Waddell assuming power, all black employees were fired or replaced. Larry, I'm just about sure you've got one of these that's probably happened everywhere in the every state in the South. But this is this is what I want to ask yeah. you. If I was someone who's a Trump loving supporter right now, I can tell you what they would say to you. They would say to you, Larry, how does that happening have anything to do with what's going on today? And why are you guys Democrats if Democrats was the party of white supremacy back then? I give the floor to you because when I need to give history from my perspective, I can trust you with it. So that's why I play devil's advocate when I ask these questions, because, Larry, there are legitimate people out there saying these questions I just asked upon you, and we have to be the ones to break it down for them. So, again, how does that that happened in 1898 affect African-Americans now? And why are y'all supporting the Democratic Party? Yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's one of those things where you have, I, I think a lot, I think a lot of the reason why people ask those silly questions, either because they don't know because they're completely ignorant, because in large part, it really feels like, and there's people that have complained about this for the last several deca decades, that there's been a deliberate dumbing down of Americans in this, you know, and in this country, and and that they've they've cut out a lot of history classes, they've cut out civics classes, they've cut out, you know, just a lot of what a lot of the of the basic American history and education that's needed so that people can understand how this country functions and the history of this country. And well, and Larry, don't, don't you feel like it's intentional? Because so much of the history of this country and how this country came together is is a fallacy of what they teach you today. You know, they teach you today, love thy neighbor, um, you know, honor the next man, all that shit. But when you really break down how this country started, you stole it from one group. You stole it from two groups of people. The queen who sent you here to forge the land, bring back the booty to her. Then when you got here, you took it from the natives that was already here. And then when you took it from them, you decided to bring in slaves to do the dirty work. Is that not some of the reason why they want to hide this from people? I mean, I think that's some of the reason, but some, a lot of it is, is just they want to go back to way the to way things were. And one of the easiest way, they always say, if you know your history, you're less likely to repeat it. Well, if you want to go back to a way things used to be, if you want to go back in time, and you, the, the best way to do that is to make people ignorant of their history. And so if you make people ignorant of their own history, then they don't see the possibilities. They don't see the possibility of the horror that will come about if, the, if we go back to those types of, of, of ways. And mm -hmm. so... But it's easy to it's easy to trick people to say, oh no, this is where we should go back to. Everything was better when we were back then. And and if all you're seeing is pictures of people in these little suburban towns smiling with the wives with their poodle skirts on and their, you know, and their and their and their high heels with fluffy, you know, feathers on them, serving their man drinks after he gets home from work. If you see all that, you think, oh, this is wonderful. This is Americana. This is beautiful. Well. What they don't tell you is all the horrible stuff that goes along with that because they like to keep people ignorant. They don't like to tell you about all the all the the other people that were excluded from the workforce. Yeah, all these white men, they were able to have great jobs. They were able to to work 
you know, manual labor jobs and make a good living and buy a house and send their kids to, you know, to, to school and, and, and buy houses for each other, for their family members, because there was not a lot of competition in the workforce because they locked black people out. They locked Hispanic people out. Women were almost ex entirely excluded from the workforce unless they were nurses or teachers. I mean, there was a lot of horrible stuff going on. When you look back in the day, when you go back even further to when they had these race riots and stuff, this is not the only one. I mean, there's lots of them. There was one of them in a town. I forgot where it was, but there was really just a straight up coup because there were black leaders and they basically went in there and killed them and took and the white people took over the town. It's just and as far as the Republican Democrat thing, this is part of that whole thing where people are dumbed down intentionally and made ignorant because People think of Democrats and Republicans that say that. And that's why I say either they're just ignorant or they know better, but they're trying to they're trying to assume you're ignorant and ask you the question is that there was there was a platform switch and where the Democrats uh, that we know today moved over all that platform moved from the Republicans to the Democrats. And if you don't know, if you've never heard the term back in the day. All those racist Democrats, those racists were Democrats, and they called them Dixiecrats. Well, at some point, when they flip-flopped the platforms, the Democrats, the platform for the Republicans went to the Democrats, which was a more liberal platform, and the more evil, racist, conservative platform, they went over to the Republicans. And that's where it's been for the last 50, 60, 70 years, however, since like the, you know, since back in the, and I believe it was sometime in the 60s when that platform flip happened. And so, you know... The idea that, oh, well, this person was a Republican, this person was a Democrat, it doesn't matter the name that's attached to the party. And there was a platform switch at some point. So, I mean, that's just, what are you going to say? Oh, you know, the 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 New, the New York team won the, why aren't you a fan of the New York baseball team? They, you know, they're winning, they're winning World Series. No, the Los Angeles Dodgers won it. But it's still the Dodgers, but they moved to L.A. It doesn't mean that 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 New York still gets to claim their victory. It's just they, they flop cities. They switch cities, you know? Mm -hmm.